Hello, everyone. Welcome to Technologies Discussion Channel. Today, I'd like to continue the discussion on EMC consideration. Okay, so for this video, I'm going to have an in-depth discussion on radiate emission. Okay, so under this radiate emission, we have CISPR 11 standard. We also have CISPR 22 standard. We also have FCC Part 15 standard. So basically, this objective of this video is to answer some of the questions based on radiate emission test and management. This will be the part 60 series discussion on EMC consideration. So guys, if you're keen to know more about EMC, okay, you are always welcome to take a look on the playlist okay, under the description. Over there, you will be able to find a series of discussion on EMC. This is my email. If you have any question regards on this discussion, please drop me an email. Okay, or if not, okay, if you want to have a faster response, you are always welcome to ask me through the comment. Okay, before I continue, I'd like to urge you guys to help this channel by like this video. For those who are new to this channel, please consider to subscribe and turn on your notification bell. Once again, thank you so much for your strong support. Let's quickly kick start to discuss what is actually a radiate emission test. Okay, so radiate emission test is by far the most common EMC test conducted worldwide. Okay, in fact, radiate emission testing is the most challenging one. Okay, for most of the time when you actually feel the EMC test, in fact, you actually feel this radiate emission test. So hence, this radiate emission test can be quite frustration also. Radiate emission limit exists in every major market globally and they apply regardless of product types or industry. Okay, so basically when you meet any electronic product, okay, for example, that particular region, okay, they have this EMC compliant, then you need to ensure that your TUT is actually compliant to the radiate emission limit line. So basically, this is what is actually all about radiate emission testing. Okay, so let's focus why we need to do this radiate emission testing. Okay, radiate emission testing involves measuring the electromagnetic field strength of emission unintentionally generated by your product. Okay, for example, you meet a DUT. Okay, so for DUT, in terms of radiation, there are actually two aspects. Okay, one is basically we intentionally radiate out. Another one is we actually unintentionally radiate out. For example, you meet a mobile phone. Okay, for example, like what I mentioned, for mobile phone, you definitely need to be radiated out in order for it to be function. Right, for mobile phone, you need to radiate in order to transmit and you also need to be able to receive electromagnetic wave. Hence for this, this is what we call intention radiation. So basically, this criteria will be governed by the safety of the product, okay, not by this EMI testing and measurement. Okay, this EMI testing and measurement basically will be concentrated on the unintentioned radiation by your DUT. Okay, for example, as I mentioned earlier on, your DUT basically radiates up in order to establish communication. The rest of the frequency, they are subject to test whether they're compliant to the radiate emission limit line or not. So basically, this is actually why we need to do this radiate emission testing. Okay, the emission can be from the switching voltage and current okay, within any digital circuit. And there are many, many more. Okay, the only question is, how large are the emission? And do they comply with the emission limit line? So basically, this is the question that we want to answer. Okay, why we need to do this testing is we need to ensure the unintentioned radiation by your product actually compliant to the emission limit line before we can actually sell this product in that particular region. So basically, this is why we need to do radiate emission testing. Okay, why it is necessary to measure at many different antenna height. Okay, for example, we need to measure at 1 meter, 1.5 meter, 2 meter, 2.5 meter, 3 meter, 3.5 meter, and last but not least, 4 meter. Okay, why we need to measure so many different heights? Okay, the electromagnetic wave do not extend from your product in a perfect spear manner. Okay, so basically you can see that this is actually a perfect spear pattern here. So basically the product do not extend. Okay, in fact, okay, they, they, they tend to be quite direction. Okay, which means that they are actually quite directive, which means that they basically radiate out in a particular direction only. 
So basically, this is what I mean. Your product, your emission, unintentional emission from your DUT, they tend to be quite directive. So therefore, a test lab has to vary the height of the receiving antenna between 1 and 4 meter, okay, as well as rotate a turntable. Okay, so let's focus on the receiving antenna height first. Okay, why we need to have so many height from 1 meter all the way to 4 meter? As I mentioned earlier on, the unintentional emission, they can be quite directive. And hence, because of this, the antenna need to be at different heights so as to have a better chances to receive this directive release from your DOT. So hence, because of this, the receiving antenna need to be different heights from one meter all the way to four meter. Okay, we also need to have a turntable. Okay, the key reason why we need to have a turntable is we are going to have the opportunity for your DOT to always have one opportunity to at least face the antenna. Okay, with the turntable, your DOT is turned 360 degree. So hence, there will be at one instant, your DOT will have a face okay, to the direct facing to the antenna. So basically, this is the criteria why we also need to have a turntable. Okay, the receiving antenna actually pick up both the signal okay, from the DOT and also some reflection of the ground. Okay, and then in order to have measurement accuracy, okay, we need to ensure that the ground is covered with an electromagnetic reflective surface, okay, such as aluminium, steel, or wire mesh. And we need to ensure that the ground must be relatively flat also. So basically, in, in order to ensure we are going to have a good reflective, okay, we need to have a good reflective surface. Most of the time, okay, we actually have this steel as a so-called ground, Okay, and the ground need to be relatively flat in order to have a nice reflective signal. Okay, what are the emission limit and frequency range? Okay, so let's focus on the emission limit first. Okay, on the next few slides, then we will focus on the frequency range. Okay, the limit for radiate emission okay, basically vary depend on the region where you are and what are the product types. Europe and North America, in fact, they have quite similar limit line. Okay, although Europe limit are slightly stricter in certain frequency band. Okay, so basically you can see that most of the DUT, okay, they actually compliant to the CE, okay, which means that they actually comply to the Europe standard. Okay, so most of the time when you actually comply to the Europe standard, most of the time you are able to meet the FCC standard also because Europe limit are actually much more stricter in certain frequency band. Okay, however, okay, if your product okay, basically are uh, catered for some industry specific standard okay for example military then you need to test your radiate emission against okay, mu spec okay, which is very challenging and then let's say your product is mainly for automotive or aerospace then you need to pick up the different standard okay based on the industry specific standard to test and most of the time okay the limit line are much more harsher they are much more stricter and they are much more difficult to meet okay so i have some experience working on military standard, okay, the military standard, the radiate emission is damn low, okay, and because of this, I always have a hard time to pass this radiate emission test, okay, for mu spec. Okay, so basically, this is the different so-called test standard, okay, for different equipment here. So basically, this is for ISM, okay, which means that any product that basically work in the ISM band, you need to use this CISPR 11, Okay, or all this, the rest of this standard in order to comply to this ISM products here. We also have medical. So basically for medical, okay, again, you need to look at this table in order to comply the testing. Okay, as I mentioned, we also have the automotive. Basically, they are much, much stricter. Okay, so basically, again, they have different sets of standard in order to comply under automotive standard. We also have this multimedia. Okay, so basically, this is one of the newer so-called test standard for radio emission. So basically, these are, okay, I think sound and TV broadcast, they are pretty uh, old, okay, but we have a lot of product that now under this multimedia, which is the CISPR 32 standard. So basically, you can see from here, this CISPR 32 standard is basically to replace CISPR 13 and 22. So basically, this is a newer standard. Okay, again, we have lots of standard. And last but not least, over here, you can see that we have military standard. So basically, we need to comply to the MU standard. Okay, as you can see from here. So now the MU standard is basically on 461G. Okay, so the latest is G standard. 
Okay, we talk about the, all this regulation. Okay, so most of the time, those commercial okay, radiate emission measurement requirement are basically defined by CISPR. Okay, I can't really read this. Okay, I believe these are in French. Okay, so basically, as in short, I just mentioned that the commercial EMI measurement requirement are actually defined by CISPR. Okay, so CISPR is just a international standard body that govern okay, all the IEC standards. Okay, why we need to test at many frequency range? Okay, so basically this is the question that I'm going to answer. Okay, the frequency range that the test step need to be investigated. Okay, usually they vary. Okay, basically we need to concentrate on the higher speed clock. Okay, so basically you meet a duty. Okay, therefore you know that what will be the higher speed clock, and this is basically where your concentration region will be on the frequency range that you actually want to test. Is based on the higher speed clock. Okay, basically in your DUT. Okay, for some industry and product specific standard, okay, the frequency testing range from 30 megahertz all the way to 6 gigahertz. Okay, so therefore they are actually so-called fixed. Okay, so however, for FCC, okay, you can see how the upper frequency range of measurement actually relate to the highest clock frequency in your design. Okay, so basically this is your highest speed clock rate okay basically is over here so this is for fcc part 15 standard here so if your highest clock so-called speed is less than 1.705 then your upper frequency measurement will be up to 30 megahertz if it's in between 1.7 megahertz to 108 megahertz then the upper frequency range okay you need to do until 1 gigahertz and etc so basically this is how the FCC standard, they mainly concentrate on the upper frequency of measurement. Okay, but for Europe, mainly we stop at 6 gigahertz. But over here, you can see that FCC is much more stricter. Okay, so basically, they measure in terms of the harmonics, whether they comply to the standard or not. So basically, it can be up to 5 harmonics or maybe the highest all the way until 40 gigahertz. Okay, so basically, this is the frequency range that we need to measure okay, for radiate emission. For CE standard, okay, basically they are much more straightforward. You just need to comply under 30 megahertz all the way to 6 gigahertz. Okay, for SEC, okay, this is the table that you need to take a look. Check on your higher speed clock rate and then based on that, what will be your upper frequency of measurement range that you actually need to comply in order to pass this radiate emission by the FCC standard. Okay, the lower the frequency range, okay, basically is defined by the lowest frequency clock used in your design. Okay, for example, if you use a 16 kilohertz crystal for timing, okay, the lab should measure down to that frequency. Okay, however, okay, when we actually perform this radiate emission, okay, typically we will do it okay, uh, above 30 megahertz. Seldom we will do it below 30 megahertz. However, for this case here, it is always necessary Okay, to ensure that we actually comply on the radio emission. So therefore, we need to make use of a loop antenna. Okay, the loop antenna mainly will pick up the magnetic field. Okay, at lower frequency, mainly the radiation is by magnetic field. Hence, we need to have a loop antenna to pick up the magnetic field. And basically from there, we can see whether we comply on to the radio emission test and measurement or not. So basically from here, you can see that we have this loop antenna. Okay, basically they measure what will be the magnetic field that is released by your circuit. Okay, basically from the capture signal, we compare okay, against the limit line. So from there, okay, we have an idea whether this is compliant to the radiate emission test or not. Okay, to cover the entire frequency range of interest, okay, test lab often need to use different antenna. Okay, this is because different antenna have very gain profile across different frequency range. Okay, ideally, okay, you want to have a high flat gain response across your measurement band of interest. Okay, without a reasonable amount of gain, okay, the measure signal fed into a spectrum analyzer or EMI receiver could be too small and fall below the noise floor of the measurement instrument. So therefore, for high frequency measurement, okay, an RF amplifier is sometimes required to boost the signal. Okay, so you can see from here, this is a loop antenna. Okay, as I mentioned early on, this is mainly to pick up magnetic. Okay, so basically at very low frequency. As the frequency increase, you can see that you actually use a different antenna to pick up the signal. So in short, okay, when we actually conduct this radio emission, okay, for example, okay, we may use this log periodics okay, at the low frequency 
and we may use the horn antenna for the higher frequency so as to able to achieve the measurement at a wide frequency range. So basically, this is the question, okay, why we need to have so many measurement antenna in order to comply under this radiate emission test. Okay, what are the typical failure modes? Okay, so there are so many typical failure modes over here. Okay, so I'm not going to read them one by one. I actually copied this from the internet. So basically, these are very small example. Okay, in fact, can be more than this. Okay, basically, uh, for example, some noise on the cabling. Okay, you you have some poor board grounding. Okay, non-optimized layer stack, etc. So basically, all these actually create some issue that in the result that you actually to comply on the radiate emission test. Okay, so basically, this is what I have for you for today. Basically, a uh, in-depth discussion on radiate emission test and measurement. Okay, with this, I like to end my discussion. Please help to like and subscribe. Okay, so basically, thank you so much. Thank you.